I often think that, I mean, and, uh, uh, you know, people have laughed about it in the past, but I often uh, say that, you know, people, there is kind of an idea of a school of Harari in the way that things are approached. And uh, and also, like, when, you know, when people are talking, like, if you went to Paris in the 1920s, I don't think the painters who were living there at the time or the artists who were living had an appreciation that they were making history. And, I, and so one of the things that I often think about is when people will look back, say, 50, 60 years' time at Harari, they will say, oh, yeah, yeah. I think I'm this to you, Helen. The notion of... Yeah, like a certain history, but also a book being written. And again, to y'all, it don't make sense now. Mm. But I can guarantee you 50 years from now, it makes sense. Hi everyone and welcome to the Emerald Hill inaugural um, on the sofa with uh, Lavar Monroe. Lavar is was born in the Bahamas but mm -hmm. lived from studied in the U.S. and is now based in Baltimore and is is an internationally renowned artist. And uh, I first came across your work actually just before you got into Venice Biennale, and I believe it was in 2013. Probably. Yeah, and I was like crazy impressed with your approach to, you know, which combines painting and collage and popular imagery and, you know, photography and uh, ha had mm. a very, very intense, strong um, imagery and energy around it. So, so I've always kept in touch with Lavar's practice, unbeknownst to Lavar actually, until oh, and yeah. then we met for the first time in uh, Miami last year, and you know started an IRL conversation, which you know very quickly led to your arrival here, which is you know, but that's how life works when you know you get along with people. So, yeah. uh, so, so this this uh, this you know this is just our opportunity a to thank Lavar for coming here, but also an opportunity to hear fr from Lavar about you know, his experiences, because sometimes people uh, who come from outside see you in a very different way mm -hmm. to the way you might see yourself. And it's kind of an, in, you know, it's kind of uh, a new experience for us because most of our residencies in the past have been with younger artists. So it's really interesting to see, to hear from you. So, uh, so welcome and, you know, Thank maybe, you. and maybe just tell us, you know, this is your first time in Southern Africa, you know, where mm -hmm. in Africa have you been before? Um, so I've been a few places, um, Senegal, obviously, um, Egypt, uh, Marrakesh, Morocco, um, Gambia. So um, Western North Africa. Yeah, so pretty much so up there. Yeah, so this Northern is very North. cold, you know, this is <laughs> No, it's different. No, it's definitely a different climate, a different mm -hmm. speed. So most of the places I've been have been very active very hustly bustly and this is just chill okay which i enjoy so. and so what have been i mean i know so in harare you've been uh, you know you've been visiting artist studios mm -hmm. you've seen places but you also traveled to victoria falls uh, -huh. uh you know so what is what are some of the you know what are the some of the standout experiences that you you know you'll take away so there are a few actually um first of all the community so from what I'm, I've experienced, it seems as if in Harare in particular, there seems to be an artist community um, in various pockets. And I think that's something that I'm not accustomed to. Community in the sense of multiple people working in the same space. Like we don't, in the US, or even in the Bahamas, it isn't like that. And everybody has a separate space that they work. Um, everybody is secretive, you know, nobody wants other people in their space, etc., etc. And here is the total opposite. There are teams working together, but there are also artists working together, which I think is something that, that I'll, I'll think about for a long time. So I think that, that, that is one thing. Um, I think a second takeaway is the relationship between man and animal. And I think that has been something that I've always been interested in in a different sort of way. 
So I've been interested in, in that man-animal relationship more in the sense of mythological histories, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but to see the respect for one between man and animal, but also the fear, you know, being in Victoria Falls, we were, yeah, constantly aware of our surroundings, especially at night. Yeah, yeah, um, When people speak about danger, it's dangerous outside. In the Bahamas or in the United States, that means guys are going to rob you or blah, 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 blah. Here, <laughs> in Victoria Falls, when it's dangerous outside, that means there are elephants around, hippos around, crocodiles around. And again, that has my mind like racing. So more than likely when I leave here, a lot of animal imagery is going to come out. But I mean, and you were uh, talking with in the past, you know, you said you wanted to become a veterinarian yeah. you know, as, uh, when you were young. So this, this must be a really, you know, yeah, so a big deal. My first career in my mind <laughs> is a vet, yeah, I'm a veterinarian. <laughs> it, you, so many things went wrong, so terribly so wrong. Things, no, but yeah, that was my career path until high school. And then I kind of veered off because of awful teachers, awful programming, et cetera, et cetera. But I say that and say that the animal is always present in my work. No, that's definitely. So you can look way back from day one. There's always a human animal relationship happening within the work, which comes from my interest and is uh, my interest in animal and wildlife. Um, but also, as I matured as a human and as a as an artist, I'm I'm thinking about again mythos. I'm thinking about animal being otherworldly. So you think about Egyptian gods being half man, half animal. Like those are the things that kind of stimulate my mind. And 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 not only them being half man, half animal, but what animal and why. And I think that's another thing that I've noticed, this notion of totem. Everybody I've spoken to in Zimbabwe spoke to me about a totem without me asking them about a totem. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess you maybe know, so. they wanted to know what your totem was, right? You know? I guess, but I... It's a, it's a very relational culture, right? And... Uh, yeah, I mean that's. I mean, yeah. of course, it's obvious. You know, I think you know we tend to know everyone's totem. You know, as a, yeah, as but a again, default. That's new to me. So I think about totem, and I think about the American Indians and sculptural totems. I don't think about humans um, establishing a totem or, or being inherited into a totem. You know, so it's it's new. Yeah, no, it's a very fascinating culture. But I mean, it re mm -hmm. personally because I grew up in Australia, it reminds mm -hmm. me of uh, totems being part of your responsibility towards nature. And oh, again, yeah. Yeah. so we're in yeah in uh, Australian Aboriginal cultures, mm -hmm. every person is also like who's born there. They, it's not. I don't think it's called a totem, but then they mm. get assigned an animal or a plant that they're kind of responsible for protecting. Mm. And it's sort of part of that because I think with Zimbabwean totems, you're not allowed to eat the animal that, no, yeah, that is yeah. your totem, which is, you know, I mean, and most of the, I think most of the totems are animals. So no, yeah, yeah. it's also, you know, has genetic implications, and which I think, are cool. <laughs> and I think in your case, it is a totem as well. What do you mean? In the in, in the Australia. in the in Australia. No, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean an animal as a yeah. as a guardian but also something yeah, yeah. you have to guard yeah, yeah. becomes a totem. So Yeah, no, I mean it's I think it's I think with most traditional cultures, you know, mm. I think urbanization has separated people from uh, oh, yeah. from nature in that sense. And yeah. I think in Zimbabwe we're we're still very fortunate that we have that very direct relationship even here in Emerald Hill. 15 minutes drive from the city center but mm -hmm. you feel like you could be in the bush you can see mountains you can see trees and yeah. and that's and that that creates that sense of chill that you're talking about yeah but it also creates a, a, a thinking space you know a thinking space in the sense of being away from normal or expected activity in that sense um, but also being in nature you know, and that's, this is another thing I, I always kind of take advantage of, um, nature. So being in greenery, being able to breathe, you know, being able to see birds, being able to see 
unusual insects and lizards and frogs and that type of stuff so yeah. no i mean that's a, hu- a huge privilege i was going to say so you were aware of some zimbabwean mm. artists work before you of came uh-huh. so how has your experience of the country changed or you know created a, i guess a uh, an understanding of the context because i find that often uh, seeing an artist's work in context really transforms mm-hmm. how you think about their practice uh-huh. because you kind cool. of obviously get the references or just yeah. you know so what it, so I think a good example I think I have two good examples but one um, so option so option is somebody who was assigned to me as an uh, intern a few years back for um, the compiler by Anil so he's one of the guys and he our relationship went beyond that because even after we did the internship thing he would con- he would continue to call me um and we spoke about a few things um one is cuisine so milli meal i knew yeah. what milli meal was before i came here because that's all option spoke about <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, another thing too is um, this notion of the totem. I kind of knew, and you see it in his work, the zebra continues very to come. Much, yeah, obsession. <laughs> but that's his totem. Yeah, yeah, no, and yeah, keenly aware. <laughs> but on the phone and talking to him, maybe that was two years ago. It was actually COVID time, so it was yeah, maybe two yeah. years ago we were doing this thing. So speaking to him, to me, it kind of seemed like such a foreign mm. thing from such a far, far place. And coming here and having been able to spend time with him mm-hmm. um, over the weekend, it all made sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it was also good to see him in person and really let him know like this, what you've been talking about now makes sense to me. So I think that's that, that's one of the um, people I knew. But again, I knew people I knew of the work of Gretchen. Um, I also knew Wycliffe's work. I also know Mofat's work, Troy's yeah. work. So a lot of people I, I kind of were f- familiar with their work. Um, but again, seeing the work in the context of Zimbabwe, to me, made everything more clear. Yeah, because this has been one of my concerns about, and we've spoken about the about the way uh, African contemporary art is, you know, served up to the Western gaze, uh-huh. and it's sort of packaged. And so some of the things that we've been working towards, you know, especially in pre-COVID times, because there's mm-hmm. everything pre and post oh, yeah, these yeah. days, is to actually make people, uh, like, invite people and make sure people see the work where it's made, because. Uh-huh it just completely sort of, you know, transforms uh, and creates a respectful context for the way you engage with the work. Because there's so many stereotypes that we try to push back against, you know. Mm. Like I remember reading an article written uh, uh, about Gresham's work where, you know, uh, the author was saying that Gresham engages with race because a lot of his faces have fat lips. And you know, uh. and 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 I was really infuriated because it was a complete misinterpretation. Oh, yeah, because yeah, if yeah. you live in a ninety-eight percent black majority country, uh. um, those are the lips. There are no, <laughs> there are no other types of lips. Really, this is not race. This is you know, this is the normal, right? No, yeah, yeah, and yeah. so. And so you don't, you know, you you don't want people, t- you want to be understood in the right way, right? Uh-huh. And in respected in the right way. No, I agree, I agree. And also, the attention to material, very dense. You know, very like much so. Very dense, but in a very mature way, how material is being used. And this is, span- I've been to quite a few studios, and I think it spans uh, studio to studio. There's always this material but also this very direct um confident use of of the materials you know which i appreciate no i i I agree with you entirely i think it's a very like there's just this strong understanding of narrative properties of materials and Uh sculpture in a way 
that that is actually I haven't found another African context to be yeah. honest where you know people tend to make you know I remember saying you know let's let's take flip flops and make some, like an elephant or mm. a fa- whereas the Zimbabwean will make a shape that that is traces the idea of the material mm. and integrates the material into yeah. into the storytelling of the of the work and there's also there's more you know and I'm sure you would have come across this I guess more a uh, very strong emphasis on not oh non preoccupation with figuration yeah, I would yeah. say I've yeah. That. yeah 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 and yeah. I think that's very exciting that kind of independence of vision where artists don't feel the pressure oh let's you know draw pic- you know pictures yeah. of people you know. and I respect that as well it's another thing I notice and I respect that this there's a yeah there's a there, I haven't seen any figures here. Have I? Well, I mean, Wycliffe <laughs> has n- that. No, because those are figures, but very abstract. It's about yeah. painting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Wycliffe work is about pure painting. It isn't about painting a portrait. Correct. Yeah. And when I think of figure, I think of something that's. I mean, obviously we can recognize. Yeah, yeah. But also, it's resembling mm. something that or someone that we know you know i think yeah white is painting yeah no. pure painting nothing but painting which is a good thing you know and most of the artists i've seen is they, they are either like pure painting or pure material yeah but not in always an expected way which i think is a good thing and i i think it and uh and we were saying that you know like as zimbabwe's we don't often appreciate what we have and i think uh, uh-huh. i think that kind of self-awareness also comes from i mean you know i'm aware that like as somebody who's come from outside and who's made a home here it's it's also something that has been very special for me this kind of that there is something unique happening oh, yeah, in zimbabwe yeah, yeah. and people but uh i don't think that i think zimbabwean artists often see their glasses being, you know, half full, or, uh, half empty rather than half full, you know, and uh, and I think it's really uh, amazing to have someone like you come and just show that appreciation. Yeah, and then sometimes I think it takes somebody from outside looking in to see how things work, but also to let everybody here know how how lucky they are to have the community that they have. No, I know all the support they have. I think it's I think it's a good thing. Yeah, like a really really good thing. Yeah, I often think that I mean, and uh, uh, you know, people have laughed about it in the past, but I often uh, say that you know, people there is kind of an idea of a school of Harari in the way that things are approached, and uh, and also like when you know when people are talking, like if you went to Paris in the nineteen twenties, I don't think the painters who were living there at the time or the artists who were living had an appreciation that they were making history. And I, and so one of the things that I often think about is that when people will look back, say fifty, six years time at Harari, they will say, about yeah, this. yeah. I, think I mentioned this to you, Helen. The notion of yeah, like a certain history, but also a book being written. And again, to y'all, it don't make sense now. Mm. But I can guarantee you 50 years from now, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think people will say they will not believe that. No, yeah. So and so was here, like Gresham was here, and Wycliffe, and Helen Tid, are you crazy? No, it's this f- must have been nuts. No, it's and they were what? Hanging out together? No way. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda was popping up. No, you're kidding me. And I'm like, I mean, I have that sense of history about about this current moment. No, I kind of feel it too. And again, just being honest from outside looking in, it makes sense. And even not only the good, but the bad, you know? So I think about, yeah, just other... There's a history that 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 that's definitely worth yeah. talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, because so. because it's I mean sometimes it's because Zimbabwe has struggled so much and it's a small country. A lot mm. of it's very hard to appreciate, uh, but but a lot of because like as I was saying in Zimbabwe. Uh, more than 30 percent of artists are represented like at an international level mm. in the very small community which is completely unheard of no, it's and and it's very hard t- 
to even explain to artists how extraordinary that is that yeah. this is literally like I- like i mean would w- what percentage of artists would you say in the us are represented by an international gallery in the us yeah maybe 1% 2% hello i mean but that's normal though that's yeah that's normal one or 2% yeah and here it's like way above 30 it's no, like yeah. between 30 and 40% it's just crazy and so there's this kind of environment where people don't even i mean look at the number of say internationally significant Nigerian artists that have mm. been or visible artists that and 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 basically like Zimbabweans can go toe to toe with that and oh yeah, we have yeah, a country yeah. they have a country of a hundred million we have a country of 17 million I think oh yeah. you know it's an insane kind of uh, you know mm. like level of success and uh, but then it sort of creates some unnatural pressures right that mm. uh, where artists feel very competitive and there's you know, and there and there's kind of creates kind of a little, little bit of drama in that sense like you said and and so I mean you know um, amid the chill <laughs> but competitive is good a little drama is good in any relationship if there's no drama in a relationship it's not much <laughs> of a relationship so drama is good okay <laughs> wise um, words <laughs> no but yeah but I think competitive because you keeping each other accountable you know, so I think competition is always good, and I think um, it kind of goes back. I, I'm trying to train my daughter into this competitive mindset, and I think, Daddy, everything is not a competition. And I'm telling her, yes, most things are. You have to compete for a place, you know. Um, but I, but I say that to say, yeah, I think it's important to to have friendly competition, you know, even amongst best friends I mean yeah if we all in doing the same thing in the same field if I'm competitive with you you're gonna bring your best and I'm gonna bring my best yeah that's that's the kind of that's a, it's a healthy competition no, it's where, healthy, yeah. where you actually working at being the best you and you know bringing your best exactly as mm-hmm. opposed to I mean there's artificial forms of competition this is what I'm mm-hmm. saying you know like so some of the things that you know we're seeing because there's outside interference oh and yeah, I think yeah, yeah. and that's I think what make you know creates uh, sort of the somewhat toxic elements where mm-hmm. you have sort of external market influences yeah, yeah. impact impacting on artist relationship where so and so is there and he's you know being sold at this auction and that mm. and and I think you know I think well, I mean like we're of course we're drifting away from some but I think these are kind of uh, issues that are relevant to all emerging artists and you know and I oh think yeah, yeah. and so what like may, maybe you could share some of your thoughts and experiences on this kind of a subject on, um, on or like basically on on the market having uh, kind of an impact on the way artists see themselves on position themselves especially when that market is say like the very wealthy Americans mm. for instance as mm. opposed to Africans right and to be honest if I tell you I follow the market closely I'll be lying to you no fair enough that's my job <laughs> yeah know, my thing is I'm about art and pure art I'm into making that's what excites me mm. I can make a hundred works and if a hundred of them are unsold I'm happy I'm probably more happy because to give up my lowest time is always when it's time for show so when it's time to take my work when the art handlers come and they start wrapping mm. up stuff my spirit goes from here to here okay well yeah for every time it's like giving away your kids for me you know so yeah I'm I'm about I'm less about the market sometimes I'm happy when one or two pieces aren't sold because they get to come back to me and live with me no. and I give that to my daughter or give it to a family member or those are the things that make me happy not selling a work yeah I mean the m- because yeah the market is it creates a lot of tensions that uh, that mm. don't necessarily need to be there you know I guess and again I don't follow it closely so I can't speak at all on it mm. so yeah no but you you know well you you get to sell I mean you know you have representation and yeah, uh, yeah you know that that's their job not that's my their, job that's their that's that's their job <laughs> yeah you I'm know? just I'm just here to paint yeah, so. I'm just here that's that's a good approach I was yeah. going to ask uh, something that sort of interests me and we haven't discussed is like you use a sort of uh, photography as research and mm-hmm. as you know element in your work but in a very kind of integrated and holistic way and how yeah. does you know you know and I think that's sort of a, a challenge for a lot of artists mm-hmm. who are you know who are you know surrounded by media surrounded by photographic images mm-hmm. but are also trying to figure out 
out of way to be authentic in the way mm. they because you you know photography and you know photographic images have become a very like mainstream part of our yeah. life experience but then you know it's for me uh, as an art critic as a gallerist it's always very obvious when someone's used photography whereas mm. in your work it's uh, much less so and yeah. so and so i think that there are authentic ways to use uh, sourced images and you know and less uh, you know or, or more sort of exploitative ways so how yeah. do you how do you uh, approach it so most of the time I'm taking my own photos for one so mm -hmm. I'm not sourcing from internet images blah 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 so I don't care for that um, and for two I begin with this photo and probably like a halfway into the painting that photo disappears and I just do me okay so so it becomes less and it's never about it's never about recreating the photo it's about the photo giving me initial clues as to how to navigate within the space the space being the canvas so so yeah i would start off at a photo and yeah halfway in the photo is gone so i'm just painting and trying to understand paint and composition and i'm ripping canvases and stapling canvases and spraying and doing everything that's anti-photo yeah no i you think know, that's so. i think yeah because i mean you your methodology has sort of evolved over different times yeah, over the time, yeah. the one thing the, the another thing that i wanted to ask you about because i mean you're you know you're turning 40 right so sorry yeah. i mean it's a good thing you know <laughs> it's a good <laughs> thing it's yeah. a good, no so you can speak from a little no the reason i'm raising no, yeah. your age is like <laughs> sh it's, it's a good thing oh, yeah. that's a good thing um uh, 40 is the new 25 uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't stop you in the club oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> as we know oh, yeah. uh, as we found <laughs> out um, <laughs> so but I'm saying but one of the things that you know I'm talking to a lot of very young artists about yeah. is that there's kind of a sense of you know an anxiety about achieving too soon too fast oh, yeah, and the yeah, current yeah, yeah. environment in the art world is like there's always this hunt for young meat and mm. always this hunt you know this pressure to be at this point at this time and I think it takes certain life experience you know and maybe mm. you could share it around you know and some of the things that I always talk about is like you'll be doing this for the rest of your life mm. do you really want your best painting to be at 25 a lot you of know? people don't get that. Yeah, yeah. But no, but I, I, I always, especially, so I taught for a bit in, the uni in universities. And one thing I always told my students is look at this as being an athlete, for one, in regards to rigor, etc. But also look at it as being a, a runner. So you have a sprinter, that's the quick ones. Mm -hmm. 25 they out by 30 and then you have a marathon runner who's gonna run and pace himself and run and run and continue to run and continue to run and continue to run until the end of the race and that's how I like to look <laughs> yes, Pippa. Yeah. Well, yeah. Can you open the audience about that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we will what open the yeah, yeah no yep. but that no but that's how I like to um, think about an art career, you know, as an ongoing thing. Um, yeah, and I think the younger generations, the 20, 20, 30 year olds, they are, they're about the quick money, you know, they're about a quick rise, they're about, everything is quick, everything has to be now. But, but, but do you think, but do you think it also speaks to a little bit of like, a lack of confidence in your ability to have a long career? No, I don't even think, again, I can't speak for younger artists, but I don't, th it's like, yeah, I, I can't speak for them, but I think everything is, is now, you know, there is no, I don't want to wait five years, I don't want to wait ten years, I want it now, it's the new generation, yeah. you know, whereby a person like me or people from my generation, we want to go and continue to go. And continue yeah. to go and continue, and I think a good example too is like people who are coming from, from out of school. Like you'll hear their name today. These the hot, the yeah. hot crew coming from school. You hear their name today. Five years from now, they're nowhere to be seen. But well, again, that comes with the quick, you know, yeah, the quick now. But 
But then, you know, you know we had a similar, I mean, and that takes kind of an understanding of the fact that art history is a fairly long time and we, oh, yeah. it's, this is not the first time this has happened i mean we mm. also like most people don't even remember the zombie formalist uh, craze mm. of the early 2000s and where are they now i mean there's oh, yeah. only two or three names from oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, from that whole generation left everyone else who was making those plotches on silver sort of oh, backgrounds yeah. is gone 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 oh, yeah, and yeah. i think you know and and I mean, but I think in the music business we have similar I things. We have, thing. yeah, yeah, like you have your one-hit wonders, and that's okay if you contributed that one hit. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess yeah, it's yeah. okay. I think art is, yeah. Those two are just hand in hand. Yeah, you mm. have many one-hit wonders, many, many, many one-hit wonders. But the people who continue to to ride. Yeah, it's and you have much. to decide who you are, I guess, er earlier on, you know? Yeah. Who you are, what you want is all about intention. So yeah, some people intend to make quick money, so that's, that's yeah. what they do. And I actually no. think that there's nothing actually wrong with it. The only concern that I have is that there's so they make so much noise in the market that it sort of uh, puts a shadow or c creates too much noise for other like more sincere talents or more consistent talents to come through. Yeah, but the real ones will remain. Yeah, they will. Though. They will always remain. They will always. No, that's always that's remain. what that's what we that's what we work towards, right? No, that's yeah, the real ones. And sometimes you know the real ones, and again, they might not have the recognition. You know who knows the real one? Our pairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have always said Our that. Our pairs, we always know, okay, this dude, he is not making noise now, but yeah. if he continues... He's the real deal. He's the real deal. We, yeah. we, we know. Yeah, yeah. So one last thing I'll say, what is the next project that you're working towards? I know you have a solo show. Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. <laughs> Stay tuned. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm... I'm going to do a series based on my experience here. Crazy. So we are, we're really going to look forward to that. And I probably may name it Zimbabwe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I'm going to do a series based on interactions here. Um, featuring well, Tashi and Amanda <laughs> and Wycliffe and everybody else. So yeah, I'll expect a Valerie painting right there. <laughs> and a more, <laughs> more coming soon. Yay! <laughs>